Hello, it's very nice to be... And... Uh, <laughs> you might as well be in London while you're being... Woo! A fantastic place. Cosmopolis. People from every corner of the earth, every creed, every religion, every culture come here to vomit in minicabs. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you might take it for granted, you see. You might get this notion that there's a better life for you elsewhere. Because that's what happens to people that get stressed out somewhere like this. They think, you know, we should, I don't know, go to the country somewhere, somewhere shire. It's a very bad idea. I, I, I grew up in the country. You don't, you don't want to go there. You've got everything here. You're not going to realize your dream somewhere else. You can do it all here. You can be trapped in traffic in Tufnell Park for 20 years and you'll never have that experience anywhere else. <laughs> you don't want to go to the country anyway. You, most of you know nothing about it. You talk about it all the time, you read about it in Sunday supplements, you're never going to go. Why would you go? It's a disgusting place. It's always wet, even when it's dry. And there's, there's nothing there. Farmers aren't really people. You know this. They're just necessary. We need somebody to kill cows. Cows are supposed to be killed, en masse as well. I have a certain, very, well, limited sympathy with vegetarians. You know, I don't, I don't mind if you're vegetarian because you had an accident or something years ago. You <laughs> fell down some steps and now you can't chew properly. I don't mind that. But, well, I'm vegetarian on principle stuff is wrong. You're supposed to eat the cows. They're big, lumbering, stupid things. They'd be everywhere if we didn't eat them. <laughs> In the library and everything. Nobody actually wanted them originally, you know? They were just mid-conversation. They kept getting bumped into by these cretins going, I couldn't take it anymore. Give me a fucking fork. I'm going to deal with this. <laughs> what people really want are squirrels, but they're too quick. <laughs> Don't go to the country. When is the last time you spoke to somebody from the country? Would you ever, ever have a conversation with these people? What did you do today? I had some soup. Oh, for fuck's sake. Give me a... <laughs> Please, give me a cappuccino before I pass out. I need a mugger. <laughs> I need to have a healthy injection of cynicism right now. And of course these people are friendly. Of course they are. They talk to you. They haven't spoken to a real person in years. <laughs> and they bring you into the house and they dry all your clothes even though you're not have been in the rain or anything and, and offer you the local thing. You must try the local stuff. Don't eat it. You know why it's local? It's shit. That's why it's local. <laughs> you eat it, you'll turn into one of them. You go red, you start spouting bigotry and eating tweed with lamb fat dribbling down your chin. Don't go near any of that stuff. <laughs> People say, I'm going to go, it'll be great. We'll have a solar panel toilet. We'll get the whole family thatched. <laughs> Rubbish. And then you get these articles about how unhealthy modern life is in a city. You know, you get mobile phone tumours, far more likely in the city. Well, you know what? So is everything else, including sex, coffee and conversation. <laughs> The conversations are totally different as well. There, you're sophisticated people. You meet up every nine months to have a coffee with somebody and bitch about their, your best friend who's not there. I hate them. I hate them more than you do. Here they come. Hi, how are you? <laughs> do you want a Nimbagino? And the, the, in the countryside, because there's nothing to do, you know what people do there? They, 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 they go to each other's houses, they come to your house and drink tea all fucking day. They crawl for 12 miles to come and drink tea because there's nothing else to do. And what people do there, they, it has its own kind of native hostility, you know. They bring out all the food in the house and put it in front of that person and say, there, eat that. Because if you don't put on a good spread, you'll be ill-spoken of in the village. So people bring out 19 different kinds of potatoes, sheets of ham, waves of ham. You take a bite out of the middle, you save yourself the price of a poncho. They put it in front of that person and they say, fucking eat that. And they stay there all day. Eat everything you have, drink everything you have, and they never know when to go. You know, they're not sophisticated. They sit there, you're there, one o'clock in the morning with the grandfather clock between your pajamaed knees, staring at the motherfucker saying, please, go home. 
You, and you end up saying terrible things. Look, we drank everything in the house. I don't think that minicab is coming. I know we had eight or nine bottles of wine and half a bottle of whiskey, but I think you should drive. I do. <laughs> I will personally sellotape your hands to the wheel. Get in the fucking car. Go away from here, please. And then, you know, there's the, there's the extreme version of that idea of escape. People think they'll emigrate, and that's it. The, the, the new life will be somewhere else, much better than here. I can't take it anymore. And where would you go? People, people fling themselves all over the planet. People end up in Australia. Why would anybody want to go there? <laughs> what is the point of that country? I, was, I usually never leave the house, but we all went to Australia recently. The whole family was a ridiculous place located three quarters of a mile from the surface of the sun. <laughs> People audibly crackling as they walk past you on the street. That's why they all barbecue. You don't need to cook somewhere like that. You just bring the shit out, fling it on a grill, and it bursts into flames. <laughs> it's not supposed to be inhabited, and when they're not doing that, frying themselves outside, they all fling themselves into the sea, which is inhabited almost exclusively by things designed to kill you. Sharks, jellyfish, swimming knives, they're all in there. And then, you know, there's, the, where else? There's the, this is the new world, you know, and the other part of the new world is, is America. People think that's got a lot of promise. Still, even though we're all a bit funny about Americans now, a bit, I think the reason that happened, all that bad feeling about America, is apart from everything that they've done, It's because American stupid people sound stupider than every other kind of stupid person. <laughs> Some people are just thick, but you put up with them. But Americans are annoying when they're thick, because they say, well, you know, I was, if they're talking about one of those terrible incidents that happen every other day in America, they say, well, you know, I was there, and the guy came in, and he had, like, a gun, you know, and he was, like, <laughs> shooting, and everybody else was totally dead. And you just... It's so a little divorced from reality somehow. So I think that's why there's this ill feeling about the place sometimes, because of everything the administration has done. You know, it's like the really bad flatmate of the world. Oh, sorry, did I break all your shit? I didn't know it was yours. <laughs> yeah, I'll replace it sometime. Um, with my stuff. And... Because it's the only remaining empire. Of course, you had an empire once. Britain had a great empire. And impressively commandeered and sequestered from the rest of the world. A great style. You just marched in and said, you, you and you, fuck off, we're having tiffin. <laughs> and everybody sort of went, oh, right, I'm going to be off now, that's fine. And it took centuries for people to go, hang on a minute. We live here. The American style is totally different, far more insidious. This empire is run on a totally different basis. What America does is it has a nosy in some place, some war-torn, fucked-up place, and that looks for oil or chocolate or whatever it wants. <laughs> and all the indigenous people obviously get pissed off, and they begin to meet, they begin to foment. They ring each other up and say, you, Habuwa, let's meet and foment at six o'clock. In the local bombed-out cafe, they gather round and they say, what are we go I'm good doing a pan-global accent, okay? It saves time, because America gets around a lot of places. What are we... Wh and this represents poverty. What <laughs> hey, listen. Hi. How good, listen. What are we going to do about the fucking imperialistic Yankee big dog, huh? What are we going to do? They come in here, they fucking... They look around, they take our stuff. What are we going to... I'm talking to you. Put down the beans. Listen, what are we going to do? It's kind of Al Pacino from China via Brooklyn. But the, um... And then what America does, while these people are talking, it very, very gradually builds a Starbucks around them. And then they all become addicted to latte and they lose the will to rebel. And then they turn into Americans. After a couple of weeks, the kind of people who come up to me and say, Hi, I, I'm Irish. <laughs> My grandmother was no flirty, did you know her? I always say, yes, yes, I do. 
But then again, everybody did. <laughs> Now that's a particular kind of American, obviously, the kind of Americans you see in Europe, who often, for some reason, seem to be very generously proportioned. And the... <laughs> You see them in museums, blocking up the exhibits, going, what is this? Can we eat it? Where are we? Can we pee? Where are we? <laughs> and yet, when you go to America, you see that it's a, a very, very... Uh, because it's so competitive and everything, people are ultra-fashionable and very thin, really. I think the Americans you see in Europe are all the ones who stay in their apartments, get food piped in, and then they're just shipped out to, to Europe. And, <laughs> But the ones over there, you see these amazing looking people, they don't look real at all, these incredibly exiguous women. You know those people who look like they can't support the weight of their own teeth in their head? <laughs> Stalking in and out of fashionable restaurants. I don't know what they do in there, maybe they just rub pesto on their legs or something. And <laughs> You know, they look like they weigh as much as a photograph of themselves. And, and very fashion conscious. But people have this idea that it's, that it's still the, the promised land. You know, somewhere like California, which everything is fruitful and, and, and abundant. But Arnold Schwarzenegger is, is the governor of California. There's a perfectly ordinary English sentence. How did that happen? Do you know how that happened? Because I'll tell you. You know how we got into that position? He got there by lifting things. <laughs> Now you and me, we avoid lifting things. It's unpleasant. <laughs> Especially heavy things. Even a five-year-old child knows this. They go, huh? No, <laughs> fuck it, no. I'm going to put Lego up my ass. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. <laughs> He took a different approach. He lifted The heavy... And you know, you lift something when you have to. Piano falls on Granny. You lift the piano. Because Granny has mixed feelings about the whole situation. <laughs> Sunday lunch continues. <laughs> He didn't do any of that. He went right over to the heavy thing and lifted it. And put it back down and didn't move it anywhere. And then he lifted it again. Hundreds of times. And said to the people who had stopped to observe this aberrant behavior. Look how good I am at lifting the heavy thing <laughs> in my underpants. <laughs> Now that sounds a little dim. <laughs> But it was they who said, you're the man. You're the one we want to deal with immigration and water rates and taxes and all that kind of shit. <laughs> Now wait. What we need to know is, how bad was his predecessor at that job? You know, this must have been somebody who came to work covered in children's blood every morning. <laughs> he, he drives one of these vehicles, you know these things, they're called Hummers, you know? It's like a big four-wheel drive thing. Huge. How small does your cock have to be? <laughs> to make you walk into a car showroom and say, listen, I need something the size of a school so people know I'm around. As if driving wasn't already aggressive enough. You see people behind the wheels of these things. They change, you know, in those big built-up vehicles. You have them here in London, you know, because it's difficult, obviously, the coffee is on one side of the street and you have to get your newspaper from the other. It's tough, I know. And People change to get behind the wheel of those things. They lose the ability to distinguish between an empty packet of crisps and your children. And <laughs> driving is incredibly aggressive. I started to learn recently. I don't know, I don't know how to drive, and it's fairly pathetic, you know, because I'm, I'm 30, nearly 35. It's ridiculous. And then I started getting nervous because I can't swim either, and I thought, you know, what if I crash into a lake? I am fucked. But then, <laughs> you learn very, very quickly that it is mostly about swearing. Actually, that's all you're doing, swearing in a box with wheels. Because <laughs> you don't swear like that with any other activity in your day. You don't allow yourself. It's okay when you're driving for some reason. If somebody blocks you when you're walking, you positively Edwardian in your manners. You do this sheepish little smile together, and you step aside, and you both do it at the same time, and you go, oh, for goodness sake, what to do? <laughs> oh, dear me. 
I'll just, uh, I'll just, oh, we did it again. Do you believe it? I can't believe it. We should be on the stage. Uh, one more time, I'll just, oh, how did we ever get this far as a species? But for some reason, in a, in a car, that becomes, you spoke, bucket! From, you know, an 89-year-old church warden. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a... <coughs> Something it'll clear up. It might take me with it, but you know, we'll see. <laughs> All this aggression is terrible, actually. You see that everywhere. People have, you know, you think you're mad at the other motorist in that case. Probably something else. You know, it's probably something in your own past. Probably, I don't know, mad at your mother or something. That's why you find yourself as a 45 year old person on the street shouting. There must be a story behind all those people you see mumbling on the street having those intense conversations that look really, really significant except nobody else is there. And then, you know, you're probably mad at something. I don't, because everybody remembers you would be alone in the, in the kitchen and uh, twilight would be dwindling and you could hear the far-off cries of the other children playing nearby. And you know, you'd be alone in the kitchen because it was your special treat time where you, the, the jelly would come out just for you. And your mother would appear at your side just this vision of Laura Ashley print dress smelling of magnolias and biscuits and put the jelly in front of you the, and, and, and you would pull your chair in and then the old-fashioned bar of ice cream would come down the one that had to be cut with a bread knife before the two sides were flanked with wafers and you would lift your little spoon up excitedly to press it in and winkle out that first divot of black jelly and, and, and then the cage would come down Cage with the Japanese fighting spiders inside. <laughs> she would strike a match off her forearm and go and tell you to dance in the front room for money. <laughs> and you never forget that shit. You know, it never goes. Away. <laughs> but this idea of the good life being elsewhere does possess people. And I suppose a lot of people now, because Europe is freed up and everything, people move within Germany. A lot of, uh, within Europe rather. I mean, I said Germany, but I meant Europe. <laughs> I don't know why I said Germany. But loads of people did go to Germany, actually. Recently, for the World Cup. A lot of English people went over to make uninformed, prejudicial remarks about German <laughs> people and Germany. Totally ignorant and bigoted. N know nothing about it, but they feel free to insult it because they're English and they're bigoted and because Germany is a toilet <laughs> a truly dreadful place nobody ever has any reason to go there it is a, it is a totally dreadful place and that's just the way it is because if you're talking to uh, you know a, a modern I went there on the same weekend I went to Australia and California and it's a you see, the thing is, you're talking to a modern, nice, affable German person and they're saying to you something like, you know, well, it's a critical time now for Germany within Europe, also globally, economically, we're pretty good, we have been better, but uh, we're very vibrant in the theatre and arts and so on. All the time you listen to this, you're thinking, hmm, mm, yeah, yeah, hmm, Hitler, 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 Hitler. <laughs> There's a Hitler when you did the Hitler thing with Hitler. And Hitler, come out, <laughs> Hitler, Hitler. And the people look like pork. You can't get away from that. They do. They look like pork scratchings on a towel. And you can't eat the food because you would have to complain about it. And that would mean speaking German. It's a disgusting language. Nobody should ever speak it. Even Hitler was vegetarian. That's how bad the food is. And you couldn't speak German because it's a horrible sound. It sounds like typewriters eating tinfoil being kicked down the stairs. And it, somebody is talking to you in German. They're saying, And you think, what is happening to you from behind? How can we make it stop? Please go away. Now that's not prejudice, that's just observation. And the <laughs> thing is, English people are very bigoted though, I find. I say that as a neutral Irish person. You know, Ireland wasn't involved in the war at all. Ireland's reaction in the war was to go, what? There's a what on? Sorry, what? I'm not dressed. What is it? What? You want a, you want a what? We need, you need to, uh, what? What is it? A war? Oh, it's all over, is it? Oh, we'll give it. Yeah, what do you want? And uh, not very useful. And 
But English people are quite prejudiced, I think, because I've noticed this recently, because I have lots of English friends who are very dear to me, and I realized recently, when you're talking to an English person and you're from elsewhere, they share with you, they do a lovely thing when they're talking to you. They, they impersonate you as they're talking to you. <laughs> Somebody says to me, do you want another drink then? You know, in that English voice that suggests they're just about to die at any moment. <laughs> do you want another drink? I would. I'd love another drink. That'd be great. That'd be grand. Thank you. They do you. They go, I would, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. That'd be lovely. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> no, nah, it's just funny because you're Irish and that, you know. Because that's still how Irish people are seen as twinkly eyed fuckers with a pig under their arm, <laughs> high stepping around the world, going, I'll paint your house now, but watch out. I might steal the ladder. Ho 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 ho. <laughs> Which is only half true. The thing is, though, that Irish people are just far more emotional. We include emotion in our culture. You're talking to an English person, you don't know if they've recently died or just got married. Because <laughs> of that English smile. Hello, hello. Looks like you've a rotten oyster under your tongue. Hello, good morning. Don't touch me. Stay away. Hi. Right. Hello. And either that or when emotion does appear, it's violent. They come and play football with you and rip the shit out of the stadium and eat the chairs. <laughs> Whereas in Ireland, somewhere like Ireland, it's more hot-blooded, there's drama included in the fabric of every day. Every, it's there every moment. People wake up going, oh God! What time is it? It's six minutes to nine. Is it? I thought it was only seven minutes till we're all fucked. <laughs> What's the weather like? Don't tell me, I can't bear to hear, I look myself. Ah! It's fierce, mild. <laughs> what are we having for breakfast? Are you gonna do that thing again with the bread where you put it in the box and burn it? Whose trousers are these? Come on, we'll both try them at once and see who wins. It's just... much more emotional at all times. For no real reason. And I think sometimes I'd love to be like you. Cool and calm and unemotional. Protestant in short. What a... It, it's a fantastic religion. It makes absolutely no demands upon you at all, which is why it's not a great religion. All great religions are built on shame. You don't have any of that if you're Protestant. You go to the church, you sing a few hymns, have a cup of tea, everybody goes home and has a wank. <laughs> you see... You have the freedom of mind to walk into a room and see a, a plate of biscuits, say. And you look at them and you think, well, there's a plate of biscuits. I might have a biscuit, I might not, I might have one later. I might put it in my pocket and give it to somebody else. I don't really mind, it's just a biggie. <laughs> it's not like that if you're Catholic. You walk in the room, you see the plate of biscuits, there could be other things going on in the room. The room could be on fire. It could be full of naked clowns killing each other with crossbows. This doesn't matter to you because all you see is the plate of biscuits. Because you think, oh no, I'm going to eat them. I know I am. I'm going to eat them. I'm going to eat them all. Oh no, I know I am. I'm even walking towards them. I wasn't aware of that, but I am now. I've actually started to eat the biscuits. Help me, help me. Oh, they're delicious. Oh, the shame. The shame. The shame. Oh, I can't tell which is nicer. The biscuits are the shame. It's a child's biscuit, that's perfect. I don't deserve a grown-up one with dark chocolate on it. Oh, they're so nice, now they're all gone. The shame, the shame. That's all I've got left. Nothing can make me feel better now. Except cocaine. <laughs> on and on and on. And yet, people still turn to Jesus. You will notice, though, that the kind of people who turn to Jesus tend to be the sort of people who haven't done that well with everybody else. <laughs> like the people who are here, for instance. <laughs> they say to themselves, well, I can't get it right in this lifetime, but in the next life, it'll be right. In the spiritual afterlife, which makes no sense at all, really. It's your choice, of course, if you want to believe all this, but why would you want a spiritual afterlife? Surely you should sort your spirit out now, while you're here. The spirit is what is challenged. The spirit is what suffers all the knocks. The spirit is the thing you've got to master. If you are going to have an afterlife, why not just have a physical afterlife? Just come back as a tentacle and a set of lips looking for huge lumps of chocolate to fuck. 
It'll be much more, you know, reasonable. Because the fact is you prop yourself up with your compulsions all the time. I'm, I'm quite a compulsive person. I only worked this out recently. I'm compulsive, but I'm also very indecisive. I don't know what I want, but I know that I want it now. And I thought for ages, you know, everybody was like this. I thought everybody woke up a couple of mornings a week in the shower with Marmite clotted handcuffs, but apparently not. <laughs> you know, there are sensible choices, obviously. I don't take loads of drugs, because it's tedious. Everything becomes too routine. You, you take the drugs, you stay there for nine hours going, mm, and you run out of, mm, and you have to go and buy more. It's just this endless cycle of repetition. I don't get it. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can't, you can't. You can get addicted to all sorts of things, except fruit. And, <laughs> But Jesus isn't a very good role model for children, I don't think. You know, they'd be far better off with somebody who's less whiny. He did complain an awful lot, Jesus. Oh, nails, oh, vinegar. You're the Messiah. Get on with it. Would you stop? <laughs> Batman is a far more useful role model for children. He was orphaned as well. He didn't moan about it. He went to Tibet and did press-ups and things with Bunsen burners and came back and put on the ears and got up on the roof ready for anything, dealing with his own personal issues. Jesus moaned all the time. You'll see this in the pictures, pointing outside of the picture, in all the Catholic iconography, pointing. I want that one. What's he got? He's got cream on him. Oh, I don't. What is that? Or blaming people. It was him. He hurt my feelings. <laughs> but, anyway. Now, I meant to talk about something else earlier on, and I forgot what it was. I've remembered what it is again, but I've also forgotten. And that's really <laughs> what adulthood is like most of the time. You know you spend a lot of time walking back to the room to get the thing that you left the room so that you would go and use it somewhere else and on your way back to the room to get the thing you forget not only what it is but what room it was in and you're faced with the people who love you looking at you going what do you want why are you here and you go I don't know you spend an awful lot of time like that and children aren't like that and that which is why they look so young because they always have a sense of style and purpose when they're walking around, they have a very definite purpose. They're walking and walking. And it's a great walk as well. It's not an adult sort of bemused shuffle. It's that, I'm going over here. You say, why are you going over there? Because I have a harmonica. What are you doing with a harmonica? I'm going to put it in the toilet. And the <laughs> why are you doing that? Enough questions. Goodbye. <laughs> because children express themselves. That's how they look young and vibrant and alive and why we all envy them. The child, you know, the children... Are, are, can be incredibly uh, difficult to understand when you're grown up. You forget that you were a child. Something simple like a child going to bed. You know, you say bedtime, bedtime, bedtime. That's not what the child hears. What the child hears is lie down in the dark <laughs> for hours and don't move. I'm locking the door now. So the child has trouble with that, so of course you make a concession, you read the fairy tale or something, you know, all the wisdom of the world compacted into a little story, and you say there was a little girl lost many, many miles from home, walking through the woods, late, late at night with the creatures all hooting and howling in the bushes around her, stepping over the roots of trees, and she came to the old sty and began to climb it, but it broke, you see, it broke and she fell down. And the, but then when she got herself up, she was all right, and you could see the lights at home. And she began to walk towards home, and then a thing ate her. <laughs> Good night. Night, night. <laughs> you probably sent the child to bed because you were just tired talking to the child, because the child asks you questions. You see, and this is one of the great things about having a child. You look forward to teaching this child about the world and how it works. But the ch ch children, the children... Children are, they're like children, but they're bigger and they're webbed. They, they, <laughs> they're not really interested in your views on the world. You know, they have their own questions. They, what, what is the name of the spaces in between the bits that stick out on a comb? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Well, what do you call the place underneath the kettle? I don't know! Bedtime, bedtime. <laughs> It's difficult. Children sleep in your bed. 
This is part of having children. It's very important for a child's development to sleep in the grown-up's bed because their, their bones are growing in particular directions. You see, what happens is children are actually very sophisticated. They sleep in your bed for a reason. The child is born, it takes a look around, it thinks, well, this isn't quite what I'd hoped for. <laughs> These people are idiots. I wouldn't have painted the house like this at all. But I've got to make the best of it. So how do I... I've got to maximize my resources. So the key thing is to stop these people having any more children. <laughs> so children get urine samples sent through the post and sprinkle it on their beds. They're busy people. They don't have time to feed the beds themselves. And then they crawl into your bed. And because their bones are growing and everything, they can only sleep in certain positions, obviously. The crucifix and the swastika tend to be the most popular. <laughs> Sometimes a combination of the two. But the thing that really relaxes a child is to have it, the big toenails lodged squarely in your respective genitalia. That ensures a blissful night slumber. Then the sexual kidnapping is complete. No touchy-touchy, no kissy-kissy. You two need lots of sleep. I have many questions for tomorrow. Very important. But you lose. So much of that natural, human panache that children have. You know, you tell the child to go to bed and it puts that against what it wants to do and synthesizes and says, I hate you. <laughs> I really hate you. As they're scratching their arse with a toy elephant. Now, <laughs> if you could retain that sense of self in your adult life, you'd have a totally different experience. At work, telling your boss, I hate you. I'm scratching. I really do. Every day is the same fucking shit. I don't know why I keep coming back. <laughs> Difficult to keep a hold of, though. That's why adults are confused a lot of the time. Adults are terribly confused, messed up people. That's because they forget, really. They don't have to pretend all the time. Really, the fact is, you're not an adult at all. You're just a tall child holding a beer. <laughs> Having a conversation you don't understand. The Middle East, yeah, I know, it was really bad, yeah, I wouldn't have done that, yeah. <laughs> Hysterectomy, very painful, the shoulder is a very painful area. <laughs> Being intimidated, I get intimidated by men, by other men. You know, we were talking about the driving lessons, there are guys talking in pubs about machines and cars, there's a whole culture of that. They're talking about the granumbulator on their whinny wax of their car, and they turn to me and go, what kind of car have you got? I go, I don't know, but when I get one, it's going to be a blue one. <laughs> <laughs> Men are always intimidating one another, competing with one another. They're more aggressive, I suppose. They did this uh, study, actually, in, in the University of Chicago, with women, and they worked out that women are incredibly good at reading male faces. You know, there's two types, apparently. There's a kind of round, soft, sensitive-faced person who's a good person to have around and is good, good for you, good for a family, gentle and caring and can empathize. And then there's the other type, which is more kind of stronger-jawed, more masculine-looking, smaller eyes. You know, King Kong is what we're talking about here. And this, interestingly, this was the kind of male favoured by women for what was called in the study brief relationships. What the fuck is that? One where you don't have to roll your tights down the whole way? What is a brief relationship exactly? <laughs> no, I'm talking about all this obviously. I'm talking about children and all that kind of, you know, and jobs, mentioning these things to pretend to you that I have an ordinary life. And this is because I'm, you know, I'm relating to you and you're ordinary people looking up at me with a mixture of awe, envy and lust. And the thing is... <laughs> My life is very different, I can't pretend it's not. You know, when you go to work in the morning and you're going to the newsagent and everything to get your lunch of crisps and fags or stones or whatever it is you people live on, you know, it's a long time since I was lived in a house or ate food. The, you see, all these magazines, because of the times we live in now, the culture, you know, this celebrity stuff, all these, this wall of dreams behind you, it's, you know, Brad and Angelina and me and everybody else up there <laughs> looking down on you, making you feel even more ordinary. But what you forget is that we all want to be you. We all want to have, you know, 2.3 children and live in a house where nobody speaks to one another and work in a building society or something. We lie awake at night 
tossing and turning, masturbating with both hands, with boutique chocolates falling out of our mouths, wishing we could be you living somewhere like Wilston. And the... <laughs> it's doubly difficult for me, because I'm an Irish celebrity. That's very a very hard gig, you know? Because not many people do it. There aren't very many of them, and none of them are cool. You look at Geldof or Bono or anything, they can't do cool. You, you put, you know, Bowie or Lou Reed on the cover of Time magazine, of course they look cool, because they can do all that stuff, all those looks. You know, the ones that say, I don't even know you're there, but if I did, I'd ignore you. <laughs> I'm having people flown in from other galaxies just to come and scratch me. You can't do that if you're Irish because you have a, a, the face, you know? And an Irish face always looks like it's been told two very important pieces of information at the same time. <laughs> at one shoulder, somebody's just run up and said, you've just won a hundred million thousand pounds and loads of stuff. And at the other shoulder, somebody's just whispered in their ear, but you only have three minutes to live. <laughs> That's why everybody looks like this. All the politicians and everybody you see on television always look like they're just about to pull a ham sandwich out of their pocket. And it doesn't actually belong to them. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is the first bit. I'm going to go away and I'll see you in a little... Well, thank you. Bye. I appreciate everything you've done. <laughs> I loved your early work. I think it's only getting better. <laughs> so I was talking about something, and then I stopped. And you agreed. We left it there. But now the thing is, to get to it, what I really meant to say was, uh, you know, you probably all went and got a drink and everything in the interval, and, you know, were propulsed along by your own needs having them filled, which is what we do. Some people, I, some people are taking pictures on phones. I, I don't know why, why people do that. It's very weird. Everybody does that now. We all take pictures. You do the same with holiday photos. You take, record something to look back on it, even though you're not really there when you're taking the picture because you're too busy recording it. So you're retrospectively going to look back on where you weren't and tell yourself you had a good time. And, <laughs> But that's what holiday photos are, aren't they? You go away, you come back, you say, look, it's, you show your friends, look, it's, it's us. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, but look, we're eating hummus. What a transformation. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Because you, that's what you're telling yourself, it's your reward to go away. It's just still that time of year people are going away. You can't really enjoy it. It's very hard, anyway. There's only one airline servicing the world now, Air Denial, <laughs> where everybody gets on and they pretend they're in a cafe. They're trying to shut out the one thought that has actually kidnapped their mind, which is, we're all going to die. <laughs> you pretend you're in a cafe and that's what the people are there who work on the planes are supposed to support you in this fantasy, because they come along and they say, would you like red or white wine with your piece of vulcanized lizard's cock from the moon? <laughs> How about an extra bread roll there to dip in your otter vomit pate? Are you going red or white one? What are you going to have, darling? I don't know. What are you going to have? All to shut out the one thought which is in your mind, which is, we're going to die, we're all going to die, we're all going to die right now. The plane is made of metal, the wings are made of metal, we're all eating, and I'm the only non-terrorist aboard. We're all going to die. 
And the, you kind of, the only enjoyable bit, actually, about being up there is, is if you have a family, if you're with your children and you get to see the young person you used to be sitting a few rows ahead of you who always oblige you by turning around and giving you that scowling look because your child reacting to air pressure is expressing themselves by going Maggie, Maggie, blah! and they look around disapprovingly as though you're going to clock that look and go oh sorry, I'll slit their throat and <laughs> after all you paid for business and you're a busy, busy guy, aren't you? <laughs> you kind of prop yourself up with all those things, you know, holidays and stuff especially in this part of the world. When people get depressed here, they don't really handle it very well. In other cultures, they do something useful. You know, they have a rain dance or they throw stones at one another or something. But here, when people get pissed off, they go, I can't carry on, I don't understand my life anymore, I don't know what I'm doing, I can't fucking handle it, I can't deal with anything, including these cornflakes, I just don't know what's going on. I, I can't do it. <laughs> Fuck it, I'll buy a CD. <laughs> a CD and a jacket. Fuck everybody. But because you're out of your mind, not feeling well, you go and you buy stuff you didn't really want anyway. You know, the Ecuadorian women's folk choir doing the songs of Kenny Rogers. And you bring it back, some canary yellow jacket with purple buttons up the front, and you look at this and you think, what is this shit? What was I thinking? So you take it to a charity shop. That generally is the extent of our charity. We give away all the shit we never needed or wanted in the first place. And that's why charity shops themselves have that incredible funk of depression. That layered smell, and all the women who work in there are 103. And they were 20 when they turned up for work that morning. They just aged in the smell. <laughs> Presumably, as well, there are people going into those shops as well who think, when they look at the stuff, they go, look, that mirror in the shape of a cello covered in seashells is a fucking bargain. Do you have any more of those? Do you? I need about ten. <laughs> so, what takes you out of that? What will get you away from all that? All the interiority you don't need. But children are very good, actually, for that. Teaching you about the world. Peeing on you. <laughs> it's hard to feel sorry for yourself and your past if you wake up with somebody sitting on your face <laughs> saying I'm hungry and <laughs> but you know you Women, women are more supportive of one another around children. If a woman gets pregnant, you know, other women pitch in and they sort of talk about it. And it's far more useful, you know. Men, when men are about to have a child, if they have young male single friends, they're not, they're not so good. You know this, you know, your male friends arrive and they stand there and they look at you and they come and see the baby and they don't really know how to deal with it. You know, they don't get it because they go, well, I'm here, you know, your house is a medley of disgusting smells. There's nothing to eat. Everybody's wearing bathrobes. There's no bar. I can't fuck anybody. Why am I here? And... <laughs> Women tend to be more mature. You know, men look at breasts the way women look at babies. <laughs> oh, isn't that lovely? And they... If a woman gets pregnant, all of the women she's ever met in her whole life will appear from all corners of the earth to support her by telling her horror stories of all the pregnancies they've ever heard about. <laughs> it's fantastic what you're doing. I love the way you're handling this. It won't be like what happened to Michelle. What? What happened to Michelle? Oh, did I say Michelle? I didn't mean to mention that. I'm sorry. Don't worry. She was a fool. She ate vegetables and drank water. The baby came out her ear. You'll be fine. <laughs> You'll be absolutely fine. Nothing will happen to you. She can't sit down now. Nobody in the family talks to one another. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> men are. Men remain envious of women, despite what women think. Men, men would like to, to be female sometimes. To understand things more. To have access. To have the freedom to ask these questions that women say every day. Why did you put the towel the wet towel on the bathroom floor. Well, you left it there. Why did you do that? Well, me and the guys were talking about it over a period of weeks. <laughs> you know, in the bunker. And we figured that was the best place for it. It wouldn't work in the kitchen. <laughs> the 
The questions that everybody asks now are the questions that everybody has always asked about each other. You know, you still hear all this stuff, what do women want? As though it's really mysterious, as though it's a big deal. All a woman wants is what anybody wants. You know, friendship and companionship and respect and a certain amount of leadership with submission and a <laughs> kind of cooperation at all times and a preemptive empathy and, you know, general telepathy. It's no big deal, is it? <laughs> And then when the same questions are asked of men, what is it that men want? You're always told that it's really very simple. You know, it's something like lingerie. <laughs> now, historically, there hasn't been a big demand for male lingerie from women because there's a limited amount you can do with male genitalia. There's a limited amount you can do with anything that looks like it's hanging out of the side of a shark's mouth. And... <laughs> It doesn't really matter if you put a velvet gown around it, it's not going to do the trick. <laughs> We're told that this is what, what men want, lingerie, you know? To, to, for women to look like cakes. <laughs> it's not enough that you want to be with me and love me, you must first be a French fancy. And <laughs> the, now women don't want that, traditionally women have been attracted to uniforms. So it's not difficult to know what women want. Fascists, that's really what they're all after. <laughs> Say what you like about Nazi Germany. They turned heads. <laughs> Everywhere those stormtroopers went, check him out before he kills us. That happened a lot. <laughs> but uh, sometimes I think it passes through the mind of heterosexual people that it might be easier to be gay. Because obviously, you know, there's apparently less uh, responsibilities outside yourself. That's how it would appear sometimes. And also, you know, if you're straight and you're pissed off or stressed out, what do you do really? You know, you have an extra piece of cake or a couple of drinks you shouldn't really have. If you're gay, you can go to a toilet and fuck a stranger. Now that's... <laughs> has got to work some of the kinks out, hasn't it? <laughs> Afterwards you must think, yeah, I can deal with my emails now. And... <laughs> but because of that, then, you get straight people disparaging gay relationships and saying, well, they can't be meaningful, you know, if they, you met in a latrine. But most heterosexual people in this country and around the world meet each other and get together with one another when they're totally, totally drunk. Smashed out of their minds, they could not spell their own face. And they <laughs> go home with that person. You might, spend, uh, you might spend months with that person, or a year, or you might have a family. This is what happens, this is how you meet. But you wouldn't buy a toaster when you're drunk. Because <laughs> that's too important. It's got to be crispy in just the right way, hasn't it? I think that's why you see couples sitting with their new babies outside cafes and so on, drinking tea, looking at one another, looking to the pram, looking into the middle distance and back to one another because they're thinking, oh, what the fuck happened? I just thought we were going to have a few drinks. Who's this guy? And love is incredibly uh, mysterious, as you know. And it's still the thing that troubles most people for a lot of their lives until they work it out, and which you may, you may do eventually. You hear the conversations in the restaurants, the lovers speaking to one another, and it never really changes. People compete with one another as they're telling each other that they love each other. I love you. I love you. Yeah, but I really love you. I mean, I love you. I love pencils you have sucked and thrown away 20 years ago. I, I love your eyebrows and your ancestry and everything about you. Just eat your food and let me love you. Don't speak. And they don't know, of course, at the time that that dialogue is just from a very bad science fiction film written by nature. Really what they're saying to one another is, uh, the race must continue. The race must continue. My vedudium is pointing at your thronungulator. The race must continue. <laughs> And if they don't handle it properly, see them. Forty years later, the same people in the same restaurant, if you have the time, you go there and you see them and they communicate in a different way now, in middle age. In some cultures it's called silence. <laughs> Unless I'm missing something and they're saying a lot with the fork hitting the plate. 
And if their eyes do meet this time, it's not intimacy, it's embarrassment. The man makes that noise as he chumps his chop. In his throat, a kind of horrible sound is humming. Sounds like a Balkan curse. And the woman has her own noise of disquiet there. And she's spearing her salad. Like a, you know, sounds like a dove having a dump. And then they... They go home to the bed they've shared for... Sh shared. When you shear a bed, it, it's, it, it's a difficult process. It, you know when you go home, you're a bit... You had a couple of drinks and the bed's all woolly. And you have to... Get, you have to get the clippers out. Here we go again. Don't move. And the... And when they've sheared the bed, they share it. And they get in. With the, and they have real intimacy, which takes years to achieve. You know, you're not going to get it with somebody you don't know very well. Not that there really is such a thing as casual sex. What is that? What is that supposed to be? It's never really casual. You always have to turn up. And the... <laughs> it's never casual unless you're both wearing Sherlock Holmes hats or something and you're... <laughs> covered in crisps, one of you's eating an omelette, the other one's doing a crossword, then it's kind of casual. <laughs> I'm talking about real intimacy, where people don't mess around with all that manipulating the phrase, I love you. People, you get this all the time, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Bake me a cake or go away. <laughs> Children can master those three words. What do you want for breakfast, darling? I want, I want sugar fried in honey. No, you're having fruit, bread, wholesome things like that. I love you, Daddy. I love you, too. Sugar, you say. I'll be right back. And... I mean, it's, it's just hard to like certain foods. Look at this. I'm trying to addict myself to it. It doesn't work for me, fruit. It's just God showing off. Look at all the colors I know. Horrible stuff. You know, when somebody comes to your house for dinner or the weekend or something, and they don't bring a bottle of wine or some chocolates or biscuits or something, you bitch about that person when they leave. You say, mean motherfucker, didn't bring any. You never hear anybody say they didn't bring any fruit. Not a single melon. We had them for three weeks. I didn't see a grape. Nobody likes it. That's why they put mirrors around it in supermarkets. You just say, you just catch sight of yourself and you think, fuck it, I'm dying, I better eat some of this. <laughs> they don't do that with the eclairs, do they? <laughs> Terrible. You have one. Confirm that it's awful. Um, yeah. It's got stones and things in it. What's the point? What was I saying? I have no idea what I was saying. What was I saying? It doesn't matter. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, it takes ages as well. It goes on and on and on. Oh. Now, so you, the, 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 um, the other thing, you know, <laughs> I don't know. The, yes, intimacy and what is, what is real and what is not. And I suppose, you know, the conditions have to be right, of course. For, 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 for love to happen. You know, it's much, it is much more difficult to be female, I, I, I grant you that. Because the body is more complicated. You know, if you're b born a woman, all these things happen to you. You're a baby, then a child, then a girl, then a w girl, woman, and all these things are going on. It's this constant opera where the masks keep falling to the floor throughout your life. Who am I? I don't know. Watch out, I'm fucking nuts. And then... <laughs> If you're a male, you know, you're born, you have a finger up your nose and the other hand on your dick, and you get taller. And that is really it. <laughs> and it's fairly amazing to think of the, the, the ludicrous taboos that persist amongst us informed, intelligent, able people, just from biology. For all these years, it is still a difficult thing to talk about menstruation with a woman. If you're male, and you find this out as a young man, very quickly. Because you're talking to somebody, and you're saying, listen, listen, I agree with everything you're carving on the kitchen table. I do. 
I really, really do. But do you think it's possible that you may feel this way, perhaps, because of your p- <laughs> That first high kick to the thorax generally does the trick. If you address the subject at all thereafter, it's always in the most feeble way. You go, yes, yes, I know, <laughs> yes, have you seen the moon? You don't. <clears throat> And we're told, and it's traditional, that things have to be just right for a woman, for a certain exchanges and acts to happen between you. If you care about somebody, really properly care, it has to be just right, you know. And we're told that men don't need very much, they just, you know, they just appear. All circumstances are fine for any sensitive occasion. Whereas with women, things have to be right. You know, people are saying, I love you all the time to reassure one another. I love you, I love you, I love you. In bed, as they're making love, I love you, I love you. Why have you got ham in your bed? <laughs> this is what women say. Why? I, do, I don't know. It's there. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? You're not hungry? You might be hungry later. I don't know, but it's there. I'm prepared. And. I, I, what is the noise? There's noise downstairs. It's nothing. It's my flatmate. Forget it. He won't hear anything. I'll tell him everything later. Anyway, don't worry about it. No, we must have music. All right. Christ, I love you. I love you. Now, there. Not Wagner. I feel like I'm being invaded. Oh, God, what's the point? You're just lying there anyway. You've taken all the lingerie up. This is too easy. Can't you hide under the bed and send up a flare or something? This has to be a game for me. All these games. All the fear. Very difficult to tell some people you love them, of course. Very difficult to tell your father you love him. If you're a man, I love you, Dad. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. You okay for money? <laughs> I'm very good for money. I just want to tell you that I love you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll tell your mother. You know, it's, it's a difficult thing. <laughs> So these people talking in the restaurant, maybe about what they don't really understand, will find out later with everything that happens to them. And when they go to bed at night, years and years later, they do achieve a kind of real intimacy. Where you have to know somebody very well to be able to say, I hate the way you breathe. <laughs> Why do you breathe like that? It sounds like it's coming through your fucking forehead! <laughs> I haven't slept in 35 years. Do you have any idea how fat you actually are? Do you? Do you have any fucking idea? No, you don't, do you? Because your little face is an island trapped in a sea of flab! I would stab you to death, but I can't afford to take the two weeks off work! that can't be sorted out by a nice cup of tea. <laughs> but it is difficult. It is, of course, the people who, who, who love you, who know you, who can wound you. That is the terrible vulnerability. These people know how you, how you, how you work. You can take all kinds of abuse from strangers or people at work or people on the street. doesn't matter. You brush it all off. But you don't have to get rage or obscenity from somebody who knows you. They just have to say the right thing at the right time. Your nose hair, <laughs> which is grey, is in my eye. <laughs> That'll do it. We're all very woundable. We all want a certain treatment. You want to hear things said in a certain way. I heard a terrible story. I, I, I didn't even, I, I didn't think this kind of thing happened. But this happened, this guy knows a guy, it happened. The guy I know knows another guy. It happened to him. I'm very well connected. And he told me this man was in bed with his, with his person. And they were making love. And she actually called out the wrong name. I didn't think that could happen. She called out the wrong name. And when I heard that, I thought, how would you ever recover from something like that? You'd be destroyed. But then I realized, you know, it wouldn't even have to be the wrong name. 
Somebody could just say your name in the wrong way. Because everybody wants to hear, Oh, John! But you don't want to hear, John! <laughs> or, John? <laughs> Well, the very worst. Like, you know, patronizing, comforting one. Oh, John, you do. <laughs> These things can change a life. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is all for me. Thank you very much for coming. I've enjoyed talking to you. Good night. You know, quickly, because you've got to go. Hmm? <laughs> Listen, the thing is, you will get to a certain point in your lives. You get older, you know. You may have read about it. And <laughs> people don't age well in this country. You look at them. You, don't, you see continental people, tourists, they come around. You know the people who are bicycling around in their red and yellow cagoules pointing at cathedrals? Springy white hair and rimless, lensless, glassless spectacles, having a wonderful time living on yogurt, going home and having sex, even though they're 8,300 years old. <laughs> Doesn't happen like that here in Britain and Ireland. You see people aging, it's all wrong. They're wearing brown, they're at bus stops, they bend over, holding a half a tin of cat food in a plastic bag, talking about the weather they haven't seen in the last 15 years. <laughs> Mumbling rubbish, getting closer to the grave so they don't have that far to jump when it actually opens up. <laughs> Denying their vitality. That's not the way we should age. You should be as alive as you can until you're totally dead. <laughs> in all respects, in every sphere. <laughs> it is, wait, I think you see, this is a popular movement. It is, of course, dangerous. You have to take advice. You know, you can't be gung-ho about it. If you're going to make love to somebody and you're very, very old and they're very, very old, you have to be sensible. It is, I hate to use the word lube, but I just have. <laughs> you have to pretend you're swimming the channel. It's, look, you change. You all, your body changes. It's a tinderbox down there. It would be a terrible way to be found the next morning, two charred skeletons still smoldering in the wheelbarrow position. Nobody wants to be remembered like that. You want to be remembered with affection and dignity. You might have to think about what you're going to say. You might have to say something quite good. You probably won't. You'll say something rubbish. Like, do you think this is off? They'll be the last words you'll ever say. <laughs> or worse, hey everybody, watch this. <laughs> but before you do, it's great if you can meet the other person you're supposed to share this mystery with. And you know when that happens, I think. People know when it happens to them. Because you often meet that person at a particular time in your life, sometimes when you're young and poor. You know when you're living in a room, but you both live in rooms where you have all your shit because you're poor. And it's lit by candlelight. And you climb the stairs to that person's room, they've been to yours, now you're going to theirs. It's serious. And you're standing opposite that person, and there is a moment where you realize you're not looking at an expression of fleeting lust or some sort of passing of the time, you know, in the surrounding befuddlement, where you're actually, you know each other, you know you want to be together, and you realize it, and it's an amazing moment when you're, the other person's actually taking their clothes off in front of you, smiling from the very middle of themselves at you, saying, I want to be with you, and you looking at them with their bare shoulders all shimmering in this roseate candlelight, and you realize this is the person for you, and then, and then the cage comes down! <laughs> And your mother jumps from the wardrobe with a cigarillo pointing out of the corner of her mouth. And you kill her with a trial. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Good night.